Um, all right, we'll kick off. Um, thanks everyone for joining so promptly tonight. I'm really excited to have you all on the call. Um, my name is Elise Broadfoot Mills. I'm a solicitor in the legal education team here at EDO. Um, just want to first start by acknowledging that I'm joining from Bidjigal country tonight. Um, and I want to pay my respects and acknowledge the Bidjigal elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining the call tonight. Um, I really encourage you all to take a moment to acknowledge the country that you're dialing in from. I think it's really important when we're meeting to discuss environmental protection that we acknowledge that we have this environment to protect because First Nations Australians have been caring for their country since time immemorial. So just a few quick housekeeping things to start off. Um, I'll be recording this session so we can put this up on our website so anyone that missed it, do let them know it should be up tomorrow. Um, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, and so we've got a Q&A function here. So if you've got any questions, just pop them in the Q&A chat um, and I'll read these out at the end for our panelists to answer. Um, someone's just said the chat is disabled, um, so I'll see if I can change that for you, but in the meantime, just pop anything in that Q&A and we can respond there. Um, so I'll pass over to Rachel Wormsley now to give a bit of a rundown of what you'll hear about tonight. Um, Rachel is our Head of Policy and Law Reform at ADO. Thanks very much, Elise, uh, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this, this exciting conversation. Um, Elise, if you could move to the next slide, please. So what we want to talk to you tonight about is a bit of a discussion about where this came from, the case um, for the bushfire survivors for climate action. Uh, Fee's going to share some of her reflections uh, from the perspective of her survivor. And then we're going to talk through the policy and, and what the EPA response has been and that the opportunity that we've got now to provide comment and make sure this policy um, is supported and as strong as it can be uh, and talk through the consultation and the next steps and some of the resources that we've got for you. And then, as Elise said, there'll be a chance for Q&A at the end. So please, please put your questions in the chat. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to go to Matt Floro. Uh, who was a solicitor in the case, and he's going to give us a bit of background on the case and where, where this where this path has led us so far. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Elise. I've just been moving around to sort out my network connection, which has been a bit shoddy, but welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us. We were lucky to represent bushfire survivors for climate action in this matter, and it's just been an incredible journey we uh, started uh, by initially sending a few letters to EPA to see what they were doing regarding climate and their responses were not satisfactory. So we were then instructed to launch this case, uh, this case uh, trying to compel EPA to perform its duty under Section 91A of the Protection of the Environment Administration Act to develop environmental quality objectives, guidelines and policies to ensure protection from climate change. The, the case itself ran um, over about a year uh, from filing to hearing uh, mid last year. Uh, there were a few interesting steps, probably the most interesting step before the actual hearing, the final hearing was our application to reduce expert evidence from former Australian Chief Scientist, Professor Penny Sackett. Uh, that application to reduce expert evidence from Professor Sackett was opposed by EPA, uh, but we were lucky enough to uh, win that application. And that was towards the end of 2020 uh, that we won that application. So we were able to put on some really interesting climate science uh, and the latest and greatest uh, evidence from our former Australian chief scientist, which was critical to our case. You can find uh, Penny's evidence, Professor uh, Penny Sackett's evidence, and also our court documents online on the Sabin Centre website, the Sabin Centre for Climate Change Litigation Database website. We got to the hearing around mid last year, and that was uh, quite a, a moment. We were able to engage terrific barristers Richard Beasley SC and David Hume, who are two remarkable advocates. 
And they did a terrific job on behalf of our client to uh, say to the court, look, under Section 91A, which you can see there on the screen um, in, in order form, but uh, that the section reads similar to what you can see on the screen, except for climate change. Under that section, EPA has a duty which it hasn't performed. EPA should be compelled to perform its duty. And the technical term of the relief that was sought from the court is mandamus, which basically means a, uh, an order forcing a particular government authority to do what it has to do under its legislation or under its duty. And uh, the hearing was before uh, Chief Judge Preston, Justice Preston of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court. The hearing went for about two and a half days uh, and it was just terrific working with um, BSCA President Joe Dodds on that matter. There was then a wait for the judgment and the judgment came came down um, in the third quarter of last year. Uh, we've been waiting for some time now for EPA to release its draft policy. We've been having some discussions with them in the background uh, and Rachel and Fiona have been very much um, a key part of that. Uh, Fiona as, as uh, the BSC representative in terms of um, government relations and Rachel as the head of policy and law reform from EDO. And look, uh, it's a start. I know Rachel and Fiona will go into it in a bit more detail. Uh, there is a bit of a gap still, of course, in, in, uh, between what's in the policy and what the science requires. But uh, yeah, it, it was um, a bit of a wait, to be frank. Uh, we, we would have expected, we, we would have wanted EPA to have released the draft policy sooner, and certainly overtures were made to EPA to do that. However, we must be thankful to EPA for getting there in the end with a bit of prodding, and now it's over to us and over to you, the viewers, to have a read uh, and comment, uh, submit uh, your thoughts so that hopefully we can get a final policy which is fit for purpose and fit for protecting our New South Wales environment. So with that, uh, back to Elise or Fiona. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I'll pass over to Fiona to speak <laughs> about your experience in the case. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm here today to talk about the, the impact of climate change and the urgency uh, in addressing it. Um, yes, my name is Fiona Lee. I am a mother, a political artist, and also New South Wales Government Relations Advisor for Bushfire Survivors for Climate Action. And I'm zooming in today or this afternoon from a pretty gloomy uh, Biripai country on the New South Wales mid coast. Uh, from an old cottage that our family is slowly doing up um, to move into after our losing our house um, in this area in the bushfires of 2019. Um, I'm currently borrowing a friend's satellite internet, so <laughs> I hope the connection remains stable. Uh, this is interesting because it's a common challenge of people displaced by the climate, uh, climate change impacts and rural living in general that many of us will be familiar with. Um, I'm fully engaged in following up the EPA uh, after the successful win that Matt uh, just described, I also have the pleasure of working on with the EDO on our new legal challenge of the IPC's ruling of the Narrabri under, Underground Coal Mine Extension. Um, yeah, and I'm just really privileged to be presenting as part of this panel tonight alongside uh, Rachel, Matt and Elise, so thank you. Um, I'll be sharing some of my personal story of being a bushfire survivor and why the EPA, we took, decided to take the EPA to court and a little bit uh, briefly about what uh, BSCA, which by survivors climate action, uh, think of the plan. My role as a spokesperson of this organisation and very much why I'm here tonight is to, to put a human face to the impacts of climate change because yes, we're talking about an important public policy moment for New South Wales, a very important one, um, but we must not forget that communities are right now, the community right around me, uh, dealing with the consequences of decades of inaction and compounding climate disasters. And right now, too many communities are flooding in Western uh, New South Wales and also many more bracing for, for more devastating rain potentially. So just to locate ourselves in the, in the current context. Um, as I mentioned, I myself lost our family home about 20 minutes from Wingham near Taree um, that I shared with my partner and my two-year-old child um, at the time of the unprecedented bushfires of 2019. Some people refer to them as Black Summer. 
I definitely try and avoid that because the st fires started well before summer, uh, actually in July, in what is usually the ideal time for hazard reduction burning. Um, so when people talk about that, you can mention that fact. Um, and on the mid coast in early November in 2019, my house and 150 homes, nine facilities, 303 outbuildings were destroyed. And very sadly, one person lost their life um, quite near to here. Uh, we can change to the next slide, please. Elise, thank you. Um, uh, we lived in our house off grid with a little pair of binoculars was, that's the watch zone on the RFS app, um, fires near me, um, uh, which my partner built from material sourced from the site and second hand. And when the bushfire burning to the west of us in the National Park whip, was whipped up by wind on a scorching hot day on November 8th, 2019, I knew that we were in real trouble. There was a severe fire rating that day. And as you can see, there were many fires burning in the area. Um, the other couple that lived on the block weren't concerned about the fire. They'd lived there for over 30 years. They'd seen fires before, but when it came down to it, they'd not seen anything like this before. Um, our family had evacuated and we took it with us. What we had in the car at the time, which was our camping gear that we'd already packed for our weekend adventure. And I chucked in my laptop and my passport just in case. Um, and that was it. Our bushfire survival plan was to leave early. And we did that when um, burnt leaves started falling in our yard and black smoke covered the sun. Um, because we knew at that point in time, we, we had no resources to fight um, the fires. We'd been in drought for many years. We had so little water. Um, and thank goodness we did that because our house burned down a few hours later. And that's the picture of it burning down on the screen right now. There were no fire trucks, there were no warnings. Um, we just relied on the Fires Near Me app, which actually blacked out in that moment where they took that screenshot. Um, and that's, it, it doesn't show where the fire actually is. And, and that was an indication to us that it was really bad. Um, the whole experience was terrifying. Um, but months later, I joined Bushfire Survivors Climate Action. Um, can you change to the next slide, please, Elise? Thank you, it's our president, Joe Dodds. <laughs> so after this terrible fire season, the worst on record, um, our group decided to use the law to ensure that the very authority that was tasked with protecting uh, the people in the environment could do so effectively. Uh, a big part of this motivation was the frustration and the sadness that we would were feeling when we could see big emitters continue to being allowed to pollute at the expense of communities and the environment like, um, like mine, because I'm currently paying the, the cost of climate disasters that they significantly contributed to, and they continue to pollute and profit. And bushfire survivors, many of which are in this very community surrounding me, have come through a really dark, long and dark night and faced terrible fires and lost so much that was precious to us and our sense of safety and, and the small things too. So obviously we need action to reduce emissions to keep our communities safe from any further climate dangers and a net zero target consistent with 1.5 degrees. Oh. So what does our organization think of the plan? Well, we think it's a pretty encouraging start to see a draft document that acknowledges the danger that we're in um, and that also that also acknowledges the EPA has a duty to protect the community environment from climate from harm caused by climate change. As that, that's a very big start. And it is a significant moment. And it's really important we get it right. Um, because this plan would make the New South Wales um, New South Wales, the first Australian state to put CO2 in the same bucket as other harmful uh, pollutants that need to be regulated by the government. Um, it's definitely a big step forward in addressing New South Wales greenhouse gas emissions, but it, it also needs to be strengthened. Um, I believe mainly because it leaves the door open to new coal and gas projects. Uh, and the final policy needs to be clear that there's no room for new coal and gas projects if we're to protect New South Wales uh, communities from climate dangers. 
Uh, it, it also needs to set out clear target, targets and um, for emitters um, sooner, very much sooner rather than later, but Rachel will go into that in more detail. And it also needs to happen a lot quicker um, because it doesn't reflect the urgency of the climate challenge that we're currently experiencing because this is very much a critical decade for climate action um, and the policy needs to reflect this urgency. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fee, for sharing your story again. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege uh, for EDA to work with uh, the bushfire survivors, particularly Fee and Joe, on these um, really important processes and to hear your stories, which are so compelling and really remind us why we need to delve into the policy detail and why we need to be talking about this. So what I'm going to do now is go through um, what's been proposed by, by the EPA. And there's a bit of detail in these slides in terms of what, what specifically has been proposed. But rest assured, um, we've published today, we've published a briefing note that goes through a lot of the notes that I'm going to be talking about and gives kind of our responses to different bits. So if you miss something inside, this will be recorded. And there's also some resources on our website and a briefing note. Uh, so just starting with the policy itself, as Matt said, we, we had a judgment from the court last August and here we are a year later and we've got a draft policy and a draft action plan out for consultation. Um, so there's two documents. And I, I just want to acknowledge this is a really significant and important step for New South Wales for policy and just the um, cultural shift and the evolution of, of where we've got to really needs acknowledging and it needs to be acknowledged that there's lots of staff at the EPA who've worked hard to pull all this together and to, to put it out for public consultation and to work not just within EPA, but, but broadly with government partners as well. So we absolutely applaud and acknowledge this really, really important first step. Uh, as Fee said, bushfire survivors want to see real action for climate change. And that really does mean regulating greenhouse gas emissions as pollutants uh, and really discharging statutory duties. So this is, this is what we're looking for in the policy itself. Now, in terms of the policy, starting with the policy document, uh, it's, a, it's a high level document. It sets out the context for making the draft policy, it summarizes the New South Wales state of environment information about the impacts of climate, the sources of emissions and so forth. Um, it provides overarching EPA policy context with decision-making principles and factors and identifies a number of stakeholders, that kind of thing. Um, the policy does refer a lot to existing and continuing work of the EPA, for example, refers to the New South Wales government, the broader overarching climate framework from 2016, the net zero plan stage one, uh, the implementation of the net zero plan stage one, New South Wales climate change adaptation strategy, the waste and sustainable material strategy, as well as EPA strategic plan. So it's very much couched within the framework of the, of the New South Wales government. Um, and in the context of EPA's regulatory remit, where, where they sit within the, all those policies. Uh, and it does acknowledge that the EPA under the legislation has a range of tools and provisions that it can be using now. So the policy document, it provides information on emissions, causes, impacts, definitions uh, in a glossary, uh, in, an, in appendices. So what's the punchline? In 32 pages of the, the high-level policy document, there are two really important bits for me, I think. First is the explicit acknowledgement of the statutory duty um, that the government has a duty to address climate change. And that's going from that, that court order that Matt was talking about. And it's reproduced here. The quote on the screen is, is from the policy that uh, it really explicitly acknowledges there is a statutory duty to address climate change and this policy is going to do that. So there's not just the duty, but there's a statutory objective that does extend to protecting the environment and human health from climate change, and the statutory duty extends to climate change. So I think this is a really important first step, um, and it is, it is a leap forward. When we first started the case, 
Um, there was some resistance to the idea that the EPA had a specific duty and had to do more than it was currently doing in a regulatory context, but clearly the court disagreed. And this is the first step to meeting that order. Um, and so that, this, that needs to be acknowledged. The second thing in the policy is the actual framework of the policy. So page 15 and 16, strengthening our climate change response. This is the crux and this where, is where it sets up the framework for what's gonna happen. So this is where the policy, again, it notes the context, uh, the principles, the partnerships, the co-benefits and so forth. But in terms of what the policy is actually gonna do, uh, there's a framework of three pillars. The first pillar is to inform and plan, continually improving as we listen, provide support. The second pillar is mitigate, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the third is about adaptation. So in the policy itself, there's some brief summaries of these pillars using really positive language about encouraging, assisting, listening, supporting, considering, analyzing and progressively evolving the EPA's regulatory response to climate change. Um, in addition to the recognition of the duty to address climate change, um, there are other elements of the, the policy that are really positive and should be supported. For example, it's got a reference to the science and the need to keep temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. It's got recognition of the role of First Nations peoples and of intergenerational equity in young people. However, as I said, it's a, it is a high level document. So in order to determine whether this will actually make a difference, whether this is gonna galvanize the change that's needed, we really need to look at the action plan. So the action plan itself is a much longer, more detailed document. And it's kind of set up, um, first of all, it sets the context of how the policy will be delivered. It explains how to read the actions, particularly in terms of what co-benefits are sought, what the regulatory approach is and what the time frame uh, is and how they're gonna measure success. It identifies specific actions under the pillars that we'll talk about. And then it notes the potential for stronger regulatory responses in the future. So in the first instance, setting the scene for the action plan, um, it does actually explicitly say there is a clear objective to respond to the community's increasing expectation that the EPA provides a strong regulatory response to climate change. So they're responding to the community, not just to, to industry here. And there's uh, they set out a pathway for this action plan to be reviewed in 2025, but possibly earlier. Importantly, the opening section does talk about partnerships with other agencies. And this is going to be really critically important for the success of the policy and the success of New South Wales meeting targets, um, particularly partnerships with the Department of Planning and Environment. Because as Fee said, we've got to link this policy to decisions about new fossil fuel projects, to decisions that are going to be contributing to the problem rather than helping achieve the targets that we must meet. So in that sense, it's really good that there's upfront flagging of the partnerships and we hope that that progresses as, as this evolves. It's become really clear, for example, that approving new coal or gas projects will be incompatible with the policy objectives and achieving the targets. You know, relevant laws and policies across government need to coordinate for this challenge. In terms of how to read the action plan, uh, they point out that there's a range of co-benefits that come with the action. So these include things like protection of country and First Nation cultural values, air quality and health, water, soil quality, biodiversity, ecosystem services, uh, availability of natural resources and hazard reduction. So we do strongly support the recognition of co-benefits in the policy. And they also set out the EPA's regulatory approach, like the approach they take to different challenges. And there are eight elements. I'll come back to this as well. These are listen, educate, enable, act, enforce, monitor, require, and influence. So, there's a range of strategies employed as you'll see throughout these actions. Uh, but given the urgency and the, of the challenge, as Fiona has said, um, you know, as, and as lawyers, we'd like to see a bit more of the required direct enforce side of things as opposed to the encourage and listen. But we'll talk about that more in a moment. Next slide, please, Elise. 
Uh, one other thing to note about the context before we dig into the pillars is it's a staged process over three years. And there's a heavy em emphasis on the listen, uh, learn, in the, particularly in the first year in terms of um, working out the next steps and the specific actions that are going to be developed and then the potential for escalating regulatory approaches after that. Uh, and I'd also note here um, there's different treatment proposed for existing licensees and then for new licensees in the future. Um, and we, these are the kinds of issues we're picking up in our briefing note and we think warrant a bit further consideration. So we are really strongly saying that there needs to be comprehensive coverage of all emitters with clear and enforceable limits and requirements for both existing and new licences. So we support the general approach, but as we get into the pillars, you'll see there are certain things that absolutely can be strengthened. So if we jump into pillar one now, next slide please, Elise. So this, is, this first pillar is about informing and planning, and particularly in the first year, and it has three continuing actions and 10 new actions. So the extract on the slide is just the summary of the actions under this first pillar. So in terms of continuing actions, we absolutely support the monitor actions one and three, the monitoring um, of issues, trends, risks, and so forth. In relation to the, the second action there, we'd say in addition to consulting with government experts, the expertise of independent climate scientists should be harnessed as well. In relation to the new actions under this, under this plan, there are 10 new actions. The first one, new action one, um, we'd support, but say strengthen. It's a critical time for climate change to be embedded in decision-making across the full breadth of regulatory activities. And it must be clear that considerations are mandatory. Guidance and training on setting emissions and limits and requirements should be linked back to targets and objective criteria and not based on subjective negotiations that are going on. Regarding the second new action, Again, we support and strengthen. Um, this one says require and support our regulated community to develop and implement plans. But if you look at the language in the action plan, <clears throat> there needs to be further clarity around establishing criteria to de determine what measures are reasonable, what measures are feasible. Um, this is necessary so we've got an evidence-based consistent approach and we're just not negotiating what's feasible or cost-effective for different industries. We need really strong objective criteria here. We support a mandatory survey of the regulated community as in 2A, but this again should be done really quickly so we can get on to the next steps. In fact, this should be, should be we hope that this has already commenced in the last year of negotiations, that they've already I've got a lot of this data so we can really get on to the action parts soon. In terms of 2B, um, progressively requiring and supporting licensees to prepare a new type of plan, a climate change mitigation adaptation plan. Uh, this is supported. We'd like to see really clear requirements around this and strengthen it to require that the full plans are made public um, and that standard conditions can be developed to ensure that these plans are actually implemented. It'd also be good to clarify how, the, how this process will be reviewed, like not just in terms of how many entities have made a plan, but what are the outcomes of the plan? Are the plans actually making a difference? Regarding Action 2C, as I've said, partnerships with DPE will be absolutely critical. EDO has long held that we need to make climate ready planning laws in New South Wales. These need to go hand in hand with climate ready pollution laws. Uh, we, it's absolutely essential that climate change considerations are embedded in assessments and approval decision making that's innately linked to what the EPA is regulating. So these reforms have to go hand in hand. Uh, and ne the next slide, there's, there's a couple more actions in pillar one that I'd just like to note. Uh, in terms of the new action three, absolutely we should be listening to First Nations, but we should also be extending this to enable First Nations to benefit from opportunities with the energy trans transition. And there's some fantastic 
organisations out there, like the First Nations Clean Energy Network. It's about engaging our First Nations in terms of opportunities and really deeply in this policy that's strongly supported. Um, as is the Youth Advisory Committee, because that's a way of actually implementing intergenerational equity in practice. And regarding uh, New Action 5 there, we absolutely support EPA leadership um, and we also support broader requirements across government and across the public sector for risk disclosure reporting. Uh, so we strongly support those. So that's a snapshot of what's recommended under Pillar 1 and some of our reflections. Fee, did you have any reflections to share on Pillar 1? Yeah, I sure did. Um, mostly that, I mean, I echo uh, everything that you said, but I'd just like to highlight the, the ones that I strongly support, uh, which is obviously listening and learning from Aboriginal people predominantly and the EPA's Youth Advisory Council. Um, and then work around requiring and supporting and listening first to the polluters or the regulated community is absolutely necessary. However, I'd also encourage the ETA, EPA, sorry, to inform and plan uh, alongside communities that have already been impacted by climate change um, to ensure that their work matches the scale, matches the urgency story of the work that we're already doing in rebuilding our homes and reorienting our lives um, to reduce further climate threats. And then also in regards um, to the new action for the EPA to partner with DPE, um, this is super important um, and provides a, a lot of motivation for the reason why I think uh, Bushfire Survivors Climate Action uh, took the EPA to court. Um, as I mentioned in my intro, the frustration and anger that I and other people feel at seeing fossil fuel projects continue to be approved as we stand in the ashes of our houses that have been burnt by bushfires, exacerbated by climate change, which is fueled by the mining and burning of coal, oil and gas. Um, that is a, yeah incredibly important um, aspect of this plan. Um, yeah, so we also need to weigh the cost of mitigation with the cost of inaction um, in this section, as people like me are already paying the price while um, polluters are sort of business as usual at the moment. Um, yeah. Thanks, Fee. So we'll move on to pillar two now. Um, this pillar is about mitigation. So for EDO, this is the most important pillar in the draft action plan as the primary urgent challenge is to reduce emissions and limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, this is absolutely, in our view, a critical part for the EPA to discharge their statutory duty and, and effectively regulate gap, greenhouse gas as pollutants. So this section identifies six continuing actions and four new actions. And I just note the section um, up front, it notes existing programs such as the Electricity Infrastructure Roadmap, the Waste Sustainable Material Strategy, the Hydrogen Strategy, um, and in relation to, su to supporting emerging technologies needed to decarbonize, decarbonize hard to abate sectors, the action plan notes the Net Zero Industry and Innovation Program, Coal Innovation New South Wales, the Decarbonize, Decarbonization Innovation Hub and Sustainability Advantage. I just want to note up from that investment in emerging technologies should absolutely prioritize renewable technologies and not technologies that prop up the continued use of fossil fuels, for example, carbon capture and storage. So the targets and objectives of the policy will be undermined if we have actions in this policy that include programs to facilitate the continued use of coal, for example. So just on to the specific actions themselves, absolutely we support uh, ongoing work that the EPA does in the waste sector, that, that's really important work. In terms of action number five, uh, we support an a streamlined approach to renewable energy projects. So, but we'd also strengthen that to say the rapid uh, transition to renewables is essential and any streamlined process that we have for assessment and approval needs to be for ecologically sustainable renewable energy projects and associated transmission infrastructure. So this involves establishing ESD standards for these projects, including that they're appropriately located, cited, designed and operated to ensure development avoids, minimises and mitigates adverse impacts on the natural environment like flora and fauna, 
water resources, First Nations heritage, cultures and access to country and associated ecological processes. It also has to include clear mandatory requirements for free prior informed consent and extensive consultation with First Nations um, communities whose country it is these projects are on. So developing some really clear standards will help um, that pathway. In relation to action six, tailored behavioural change programs, uh, they sound great, but further detail could be provided here uh, in terms of what behaviours would be addressed beyond the existing waste programs that are mentioned. It's, and it's also a little un unclear under this action how many emissions would be mitigated by this kind of program. Uh, in terms of action number seven, this one concerns uh, methane emissions from onshore gas operators and leaks. And I think we'd all agree that's a good action to address leaks, but this is another one that we'd support and strengthen, requiring and enforcing improved leak detection rep repairs supported, but it should be extended explicitly to include coal, methane from coal mines. Um, this could be addressed in a separate new action uh, for putting conditions requirements on licensed coal mines in relation to methane emissions, monitoring, rehabilitation to mitigate and prevent methane leakage. Um, again, this should also, this very specific action should also be linked to a broader overarching policy to reduce reliance on gas and coal overall, not just fix methane links. In relation to action eight on short-lived climate pollutants, absolutely support and strengthen Actions should include any necessary reform to New South Wales emissions exceedance limits and standards to make sure that they're best practice. Um, this, this is a range of emissions. We've all written submissions on these before that New South Wales needs to reflect best practice for exceedances. In terms of the new act actions, um, it's really, really important. And a critical part of this, this policy is the development of greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets and related pathways. It's a critically important part of the plan. And this should be strengthened in our view to ensure that the targets are science-based, they're comprehensive in coverage, and they're legally enforceable. This needs one of those require and enforce options that I was talking about earlier. And we'll come back to this point in a moment. Um, We'd absolutely support guidance for industry designed to help the community, the regulated community comply with really clear, clear requirements. Action nine is really important in our view that this is one that needs to be supported and strengthened. Um, this is a really critical part of the mitigation pillar. The action plan needs to galvanise clear enforceable requirements for emissions reduction that can be actually placed on licences. So we have, we have targets, but we need them to be translated to something enforceable. We note you put conditions on licences, but for example, monitoring and reporting conditions can be met, but that doesn't necessarily mean emissions are reduced, they're just tracked. So we want really strong, clear, enforceable licence conditions here. According to the plan, this may not happen until year three, but this kind of concrete action needs to be brought forward because this is what's going to bring emissions down. The science of climate change, including the causes, has been widely known for decades. So industry has had ample time to prepare um, for the regulation of emissions. So as Fiona said, we're in the critical decade now. There's no more time to lose. And in considering, if you read this part of the action plan, in considering costs and benefits of imposing these requirements, like the references to is something feasible or cost-effective for industry. Let's also think about the costs of inaction, the social costs of carbon, um, rather than just focusing on what's feasible or reasonable as negotiated by individual industries. And under this one, I think the potential use of offsets should also be clearly limited. And finally, on the last action 10, uh, we absolutely support innovation. Uh, however, it's a little unclear in this section, um, the actions listed, things like road shows and showcases, you know, how they'll actually translate to tangible emissions reductions during the life of this plan. Um, and again, here we'd note that technical innovation investments and programs should support transition to renewables and not continued use of fossil fuels. 
So this is a really important pillar of the policy and, and we've made various recommendations about really strengthening this so that the policy and the action plan has teeth. Fee, have you got any reflections to share on pillar two? Um, mostly just to reiterate the critically important part of the plan, as you said, about the development of emissions reductions targets um, for polluters. Like it looks like a, a long cascade of mostly voluntary actions over the next three years. Uh, and that's a bit of a concern for me um, because as I, as I keep saying, it's about the urgency uh, or the lack of it um, in this particular instance uh, because we need the EPA and the New South Wales government um, to really do all that they can now to help reduce the risk of disasters by implementing um, science-based uh, targets and enforceable, like you said, Rachel, now, because again, the window to adapt to climate change is closing very quickly. Um, and we know that there's already climate um, impacts like baked into the system that we're dealing with right now and that every ounce of greenhouse gas and every minute counts and we can't afford um, to keep increasing pollutants. So yeah, the urgency uh, is key. and how quickly this plan um, can be implemented. Thanks, V. Elise, can we go to the next slide? So this is the, the last chapter, the third, the third pillar, which is about adaptation. Uh, so this identifies two continuing actions and four new actions. And we note that there, there are so many agencies involved in disaster response and management, and that the EPA has a specific role within the emergency management sector um, and a primary focus on managing pollution incidents, but can have a strong role as well in developing this policy and in preparedness. Um, the first action number 10 there, the key action under that one is about reviewing the Enviro Plan, which for those who don't know that term, it's the New South Wales Environmental Services Functional Area Supporting Plan. Um, for climate readiness, but it would be good to have a little bit more detail there on how the review will actually incorporate concepts of environmental resilience and how, how that can be expressed and, and leadership can be shown there by the EPA. In terms of action 11, we would support and strengthen this one. So this is quite a curious one. It's about native forestry. Um, and there's currently a monitoring program by the Natural Resources Commission, which is great. But this is a very specific action and it relates to the EPA's regulatory role in terms of compliance and enforcement for native forestry. Um, and what, again, what we'd say is this is a specific action in a certain context, but in addition to ongoing monitoring, there should be a broader policy here and planning for a transition out of native forestry and really focusing on enhancing the role of native forests as sinks to support mitigation. So mitigation under pillar two, we shouldn't just be monitoring you know, decline of forests and risks. We should be thinking about transition policies and all the different ways we contribute to achieving a goal. So we'd broaden out the, the forest for policy there. In terms of the new actions, uh, on, we support all of those, but on action number 12, uh, in terms of resilience programs and initiatives. Um, we note there are a lot of uh, references to ongoing waste initiatives here, but further detail could be given on what kinds of programs will be developed under this action. Uh, and also in addition to consultation with industry, councils, Aboriginal and public land managers, um, initiatives under this action should be developed in partnership with local communities, particularly, for example, like Fiona's community, survivors of bushfire and flood events and really have that community consultation element to that action as well. Fee, would you like to add anything to that? Oh, that's most uh, definitely where I was going with that pillow is that, um, yeah, the new action 12 on the programs is that um, the APA really needs to involve climate survivors uh, well, and, and partner with us really on the development of such programs or initiatives um, just to ensure that they're actually needed, um, they're relevant and they can be e effective. Um, like for instance, uh, our, um, when the communities around here were impacted by fires, there was 
people really came together and forged the road to like renewal and recovery together and address the issues that we faced post-disaster and simultaneously prepared for the next ones that we knew were coming down the line. And the EPA can really learn a lot um, from us in these experiences. So I'd like to see them, you know, visit our communities, our local halls and community centres to really um, start these conversations and form genuine partnerships on the development of um, programs and initiatives. Thanks, Pete. Uh, and Elise, if we can just go to the next slide, please. So if you go to the end of the action plan on the very last page, I think it's page 50, there's half a page called Stronger Regulatory Responses We'll Consider in the Future. Um, so EDO, we'll put a link in, in the chat, but EDO back as part of the case <clears throat> when we first commenced, we also published a report about the powers that the EPA has and how they could use those power, <clears throat> powers to regulate pollution. As, as acknowledged, um, New South Wales legislation already has a range of powers. Um, thank you, Elise, for putting, putting the link in the chat there. Uh, a range of powers and tools that can and should be used. They've been in the legislation a long time. There's no reason that, why they cannot start being used. Um, we welcome the acknowledgement that the EPA has these tools, but there needs to be a clear point in time that the EPA will escalate this regulatory approach. If we get to 2025 and it appears that the consultative and the softer approach of many of these actions in the draft action plan has not in fact reduced emissions in line with the necessary targets, is it only at 2025 that we'll start considering the use of these other tools? So we're in the critical decade now we need the rapid emissions reduction to start now. So we strongly think that there should be the process for developing stronger approaches should com commence now concurrently with the other softer actions that have been suggested. Um, we've, we've recommended some of the KPIs be made far more specific. So the key performance indicators currently set out in the action plan tend to identify like the proportion of the action that's achieved that will be reported annually, like how many of these new climate plans are made. Um, but it's not clear what proportion the EPA is actually aiming for within the three years, you know, 10% of entities with a plan, is that enough? Um, the draft action plan should be strengthened to clarify at what point there'll be a clear trigger for stronger regulatory measures to be implemented. This will give more certainty to industry and also to community and a clearer tra trajectory for the actual emissions reduction. So as you can see in the picture here, um, this is a, a snap from the policy as well. And there are different approaches that the EPA takes, but the listen and educate, and there's a heavy emphasis on that. We would like to see a clearer time frame for, for the other steps, when they will be triggered, when we'll see more of the enforce and require actually being put. Because if we get to 2025 and we're only just starting to do that, we're really worried that we're going to be halfway through the critical decade. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Elise. That's the, the snapshot of, of the... Um, of the pillars. I just want to spend 10 minutes now just pulling together some of the key themes and issues, and that should leave us plenty of time for discussion and questions. So in terms of what to support in the plan, and if you think of a submission, there, there is an awful lot to support in this plan. As I said at the beginning, it's really important to acknowledge this is a step forward. It, re it represents a cultural shift in confirming and discharging a duty to regulate greenhouse gas pollutants. Um, that is strongly supported. And, you know, EPAs in other jurisdictions who've tried to do this have come, against, come up against some severe criticism from industry and other, other bodies. So I think we acknowledge this is an important step. In this context, the really important parts of the policy for us uh, are the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets setting those really clearly with a time frame and enforceability. The greenhouse gas emission limits and other requirements, we want those to be on licenses. We want them to be really, really clear for industry and for the community. Embedding climate change considerations into EPA 
Decision making is critical, but as I've said, embedding climate change considerations into planning decisions is also absolutely necessary for this policy to succeed. So that's decisions about fossil fuel projects going forward uh, and renewable energy projects and bringing in all the relevant decisions. And foreshadowing the stronger regulatory responses is really important, but we'd like to bring forward the, the timetable on those. Other areas of the policy that uh, you might want to support in your submission or you might want to add some commentary on are uh, the requirements for climate change mitigation adaptation plans, public annual reporting on progress. So if we can strengthen the KPIs, that, that's going to be really useful to see if this policy is actually on track or whether it does need to, to be strengthened. Environmental justice principles, that's really important because the EPA just isn't just there to service a regulated community of industry. The EPA is also there with a broad remit for public health and environmental health. And that environmental justice principles are really relevant to that, particularly for communities overburdened um, and survivor communities who are overburdened and, as Fee said, are bearing the cost of this crisis at the moment. The First Nations engagement is to be supported, as is the engagement with youth uh, in the intergenerational equity. The recognition of co-benefits uh, is a really positive move. Uh, Climate-related risk disclosure, disclosure and as I said, the interagency cooperation. So there's some really good elements in the policy that should be supported and they can be strengthened and hopefully will be evolved going forward. Uh, next slide, please, Elise. In terms of just drawing together some of the themes that you will have noticed when we're going through. There, there are certain themes that have come out about what, what we'd really like to see strengthened in this policy so that it is fit for purpose. And I think I, you would it'd be no surprise from what I've said so far, we would really like to see enforceability of targets uh, and license requirements. Those kind of elements and actions in the plan, we'd like those brought forward and clarified. So. The language throughout the policy and the action plan, it really heavily emphasises the collaborative role, supporting, consulting, listening, guide, guiding, signalling, encouraging. There's lots of very positive verbs here, um, but it's support and encourage rather than require or direct. Um, references to imposing and enforcing clear requirements and limits uh, in terms of the more direct regulation are noted as a potential future action. Uh, for example, there may be a requirement to make one of these new plans, but it's a discretionary consideration as to whether there will be any conditions requiring implementation of that plan, for example. We'd like to see things like that tightened up. The action plan, as I said, uh, sets out a staged approach for different sectors or subsectors, and it's heavily based on what industry tells the EPA is feasible. Um, and obviously consultation and feasibility are considerations, but we need that clear commitment that targets will be based on scientific evidence of what emissions reduction is needed. And if a sector or an individual emitter argues the target is not feasible or cost-effective for them, does that mean the target will be reduced? Like where, where are the objective criteria here? Um, in terms of enforceability, there are some worrying, reference, confusing references in the policy about target and the fact sheets, also the targets themselves will not be enforceable. They'll apply to an industry sector as a whole, not a license. Um, however, they'll be tailored and transparent signals. That's one as aspect of the policy. Sector targets will inform, not dictate license requirements. They won't be translated directly onto license conditions. Um, however, they will guide, such as the language like that. What we need is some clarity around this, because if it's all discretionary, how are we actually going to measure how whether we're actually, this policy is making a difference? So we'd recommend the draft policy and action plan are, are strengthened to set a clearer signal that targets will be comprehensive in covering new emitters and existing emitters, a range of sectors, not just a few subsectors, um, that they're science-based and they'll be enforceable within the next three years. Negotiated targets for certain subsectors may achieve some, some gains, but we need a comprehensive gain under this policy. 
timeframes for action, as we, as Fiona and I have both said, critical decade. We don't want to get halfway through this decade and find this policy is, is too polite. We need to know how it's tracking. We need to bring forward the things that are actually going to result in emissions reduction. Um, we recommend that clearer timeframes and triggers are set within the policy. Bring forward the tangible actions to rapidly improve priority areas. For example, bring in actions, clear enforceable requirements to rapidly reduce coal mine methane and some quite specific actions brought forward with clarity. We support the reference to tracking progress against key performance indicators in the annual report, but the indicators need to be far more specific. And we need to commence those discussions about stronger regulatory approaches now, not start that consultation period halfway through this decade. As I said, industry has been on notice for decades about this. So, and the government has a range of effective regulatory tools already. So the arguments in favour of minimal interventions are inconsistent with the urgency of this task. As mentioned, com comprehensive coverage, um, the draft action plan and policy have different approaches for new as opposed to existing licences. For example, um, new entrants might have licence requirements and conditions put on, whereas existing licensees might only need to make one of the new plans with some emissions benchmarking. There needs to be more detail on this approach. The most significant emitters need to be subject to the appropriate limits and requirements. Um, in order to achieve targets, planning law reforms and clear enforceable emissions reduction requirements for all licenses are required. We also note the EPA intends to focus on industries that are not currently subject to requirement. It's not ha clear how the EPA will determine sectors to focus on and how it will address high emitting sectors such as coal. This needs to clarify, so the community has confidence that this policy will be addressing the biggest emitters and the statutory duty will be being discharged. The whole of government approach is absolutely critical. We need, we need the, all the right agencies around the table. We need multi-agency co coordination and a, we're recommending a, a cross-government technical group is, is strongly supported. Um, there's parts in, in the policy where they do talk about planning, but then they had a, have one sentence such as, it is, it is currently government policy that the New South Wales 2030 target is not to be considered in the assessment or determination of development and infrastructure under, under the Planning Act. So as a start, obviously we've got a dis, like disconnects here between different elements of government policy that are directly related to the achieving, achievement of these targets. This needs to be thought through systematically and we need to have all the right agencies around the table. Um, as noted, like we need to have industry, transport, agriculture departments and agencies at the table. That there's a risk that conflicting agency objectives might undermine this policy and action plan. For example, there's predicted carbon abatement from land use, land use change and forestry. So this requires strong laws about land clearing and forestry. But in New South Wales, land clearing has been essentially deregulated under vegetation clearing codes. So how does that, how does the modelling way up there where you've got conflicting um, policy objectives? This regulatory setting is at odds with the broader climate policy. Forestry, local land services need to be included in this conversation. We really see a role for EPA leadership in bringing together other organisations and really getting that cohesive work on the policy. Uh, as mentioned, we strongly think that ecologically sustainable renewable energy pathways should have some principles around them to ensure that they're truly ecologically sustainable and First Nations impacts are considered to really help drive that. There's been some great work done on that. And also we would like to see some clear limits around uh, the use of carbon offsetting. Some of you may have just put in a submission to the federal um, process, the Chubb review into Australian carbon credit units. Uh, and you'll know that there are some significant concerns around carbon offsetting in Australia. So we don't want a policy that sets targets, but allows a lot of wriggle room in that you can just buy 
some questionable credits to achieve your targets rather than actually bringing emissions down. So we'd love to see some leadership and vision from the EPA. I think we're, they're showing it by producing this, these two documents and putting them out for consultation. Uh, that's to be applauded, applauded, but we want to see a bold, ambitious vision in the finalised policy and action plan. So absolutely, we acknowledge EPA has a really specific regulatory remit as per their legislation, but their objectives and their role in protecting the environment and protecting public health, they're broad and the targets are statewide. So the draft action plan and policy should be designed for the environment, should be designed for climate affected communities like fees, just as much as they're being designed for regulated communities to bring them along. Uh, the EPA is not just a service orientated organisation, but you know that broader remit of environmental justice, particularly to overburdened communities is important. So we'd say the, the policy has got to be comprehensive in coverage, cross sectors and address the biggest emitters, both new and existing. It's got to identify specific outcomes and really have those scale up triggers uh, and have all relevant agencies sitting around the table. So on that, we're, we've talked until seven there. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Elise. Um, Fee's just going to talk about the next steps and some of the resources that we've got if you are hoping to put a submission in and you'd like a little bit of help. And then we will go to the, the Q&A section. So over to you, Fee. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, yep, so Joe Dodds has just posted the link to the EPA website uh, in the Q&A there where I believe it's visible. Um, you can see on the website there's an online survey. Um, there are no restrictions on who can make a submission. Uh, anyone in Australia or overseas uh, can do it. Uh, most importantly, they close at five o'clock on November the 3rd, uh, 2020, um, uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. And you certainly don't need to be an expert to make a submission. Our stories matter um, because it's important, important that the EPA hears from people um, with a range of experiences and perspectives, including people who've been impact impacted by climate change. Um, and uh, maybe you could consider whether you can apply on behalf of your business or your employer, perhaps ask uh, if your employer could back the submission, or perhaps you could write in a professional capacity. Um, and just, but just remember that your feedback is important and it can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. Uh, there's two ways you can make feedback. One is by emailing the EPA directly and I'll pop the um, email address in the chat there. Um, you can, you know, type a Word document and attach the email and just send it off to them. Uh, on their website, you'll find the online survey, which has three questions. You're not required to answer them all and you also have the opportunity to upload um, documents there. The three questions are outlined in our submission guide. Um, and I imagine two in the EDO one. And the first question is just asking for general comment on the action plan. So there's plenty of um, opportunities to tell your story or share your perspective in there. And you're not restricted to answer questions in the survey, of course. So if you wanted uh, to talk about how the, the, the EPA can work with New South Wales government on a range of other issues, then um, you, know, you, you have the opportunity to do it there. So like, if you're really interested in the electrification of homes or incentivizing people to move away from gas um, or you know, uh, electric vehicle uptake, then, then you can certainly do that there. Uh, this is a good opportunity to, fire, to provide feedback to a government agency. Um, so we should take that moment. The second question is about is, are there any other initiatives or actions that should be included in the plan and what they might be if you think there are? So obviously put your additional actions in there. The third question is related to New South Wales government policy. So if you uh, think the action, do you think the actions of this plan complement the other initiatives being delivered by the New South Wales government, including their net zero plan and the electricity infrastructure roadmap? So they're asking, do you think they complement each other? Um, and certainly if you're across these documents, you can talk about the intersections or gaps. It could also be the spot to talk about the need for New South Wales government policy 
to address that dissonance that Rachel was describing in the exemption of assessments and determinations of projects from uh, considering New South Wales climate targets. So the EDO uh, submission guide's already been linked there. Uh, BSCAs is also available. Obviously they come from different perspectives. The EDOs is uh, the legal analysis um, that Rachel provided um, and Bushfire Survivors for Climate Action is uh, I guess more for community members and people impacted by climate change to share their stories and experience. I would like to encourage everybody to make a submission. Um, it doesn't take very long online. You could probably do it in 10 minutes uh, because this is a really very significant policy moment for New South Wales and it's crucial we do get it right. So please take the time to check out those resources and to help us to ensure that we do get a really strong result with this policy. And just a reminder, it's the 3rd of November that it closes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Rachel, do you want to move to questions now? Uh, yes, we can we can leave um, that slide up. I think the next slide just says says questions. So I I think um, um, we've got some in the in the chat. Yeah, I'll leave this slide up so people that QR link has got um, a bunch of EDO resources there, and I'm just adding um, our briefing note, which is kind of a summary of everything Rachel's talked about today. I've just linked that in the chat as well, um, and I've linked um, bushfires submission guide as well as EDO's submission guide um, and that um, empowering the new proposal EPA to prevent climate pollution Rachel mentioned earlier on in the presentation is in the chat so a bunch of links for you to pull up there um, but yes we'll go to some questions because we've got lots coming through the chat thank you everyone for putting those in um, we might start with climate pollutants, because we've had a few questions about specifically what pollutants the EPA is now considering regulating. And kind of a second part of that question, is there any that have been left out that people should suggest be included in their submissions? Yeah, I think the, that's a, a great question. Um, the policy itself doesn't, it talks about um, the, it talks about methane, it talks about um, the, hang on, let me find the exact one, talks about in the mitigation pillar, so in number two, short-lived climate pollutants, at least if you go to that section, so that, that's action, continuing action number eight under pillar two, that talks about um, short-lived climate pollution, pollutants. And then we've got the the action above that number seven talks about methane. So there are some, kind of certain areas in the action plan that are cherry picked for certain things. And remember that the EPA does currently regulate a whole range of pollutants. Um, and so this policy is kind of drawing on what they already regulate and then suggesting some areas where they'll do specific actions. But I think a really good idea for the submission process would be if you've got if you've got data or evidence or particular information on a pollutant that's been poorly regulated that is contributing to this harm, absolutely put it in your submission, um, put the evidence forward and suggest an action relating to that pollutant so that we've got that comprehensive approach and we don't end up with a policy that is just doing very specific things on specific uh, pollutants but is not actually getting us where we need to go in terms of the overarching policy. So if you've got specific ones in mind, whoever asked that question, then absolutely put that in your submission. Thank you. Um, all right, next question. We've had a few questions about um, clean fuel logging, native forest logging, um, as well as domestic fuel combustion. Is this something that people could suggest be pulled into the policy as well? Is this the appropriate place? Yeah, it, it is a really difficult one because I imagine people well, and EDO, we want to put a lot into our, and into our submission about all the things that need to be done on climate change. The response from EPA will likely be we have a very specific remit of what we do under legislation. So what we want to do is try and 
yes, get them to focus on what their remit is, but the court has said they have a statutory duty that's pretty broad in relation to the environment and health, protecting them from climate change. So we need to push that and encourage EPA to be a leader. On things like forestry, the example that I gave um, with the native forestry monitoring, that's a really good example because the EPA have a specific role with compliance and enforcement. But if you're thinking logically about the climate challenge and the role of forests, it's not just monitoring we need, it's actually, it's the transition policies, it's linking up the different government policies from different agencies to make sure that we've got a comprehensive policy here. And that comes back to getting agencies around the table. The EPA itself might not be able to change forestry policy or uh, change things that are in other legislation that they're not responsible for. But I think if we can really encourage that interagency forum and that review of government policy that is needed to ensure that we don't have policy at cross purposes here. We don't want the situation where the EPA produces a great policy and action plan, but achieving success through that action plan is actually undermined because you have different agencies doing a resource extraction, whether it's coal or forestry, native timber, water, the whole range of agencies need to be in the conversation to ensure policy coherence. Um, all right, next question is, um, someone's asked whether EPA has roles in post-fire flood resilience. And I know Fiona, you kind of um, answered this one in the chat, but I just thought it'd be helpful to, to bring that to the wider audience. Is there any further comments on that? Uh, my understanding is that they're mostly involved in the incident response and the recovery programs um, at this stage. Is that yours, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, there are some discrete roles the EPA has post-disaster or post-event. Um, we were particularly concerned about um, logging that was happening post-bushfires in heavily impacted areas. There was salvage logging going on, and we were encouraging the EPA to take a strong role in terms of stepping in. Um, but in relation to flooding, I'm not, I'm not sure, but absolutely, I think we can, in your submission, if you've got stories to tell about that or a recommended action that could fit within the, the EPA's role or something that they could lead and coordinate, absolutely put that in your submission. Um, someone's asked if there's any details about the Indigenous engagement, um, and they've put the example that current legislation is written for hazard reduction burns, and um, some groups find it quite difficult to fit cultural burning into that regulation. So is there any detail in the policy about that engagement, or is that an area that people should put submissions in for? Uh, there's not a lot of detail in, in how that engagement will work. So that's in the first pillar in the inform and plan. Um, that's let me just find the action that's yeah action three and the new actions um and it just says listen to and learn from aboriginal people create opportunities to meaningfully engage and receive feedback on our climate change response so to me certainly in learning from aboriginal people cultural burning would be a great a great partnership and absolutely that's an area um where it would be great if lots of first nations communities gave some input and um, on how that should work and also the con how the consultation is done by EPA that, that should be co-designed with First Nations people for what's appropriate and what, how it could work best for First Nations communities. So there is a bit of a lack of detail in the policy on how that would work and I think um, the EPA would probably love to hear some suggestions on how that could be best be done and particularly on specific issues like cultural burning um, the best ways that those partnerships can be developed and that engagement can be done because we don't want the policy to just have a high level action about engagement, but then for that to be done in a tokenistic way and not a genuine way. So I think it would be really great if submissions gave suggestions about how that particular action um, could be done appropriately and, and make it actually work for First Nations communities. Um, okay, someone in the chat has described the EPA in the past as a toothless tiger, and they've asked, um, how can we be hopeful in this policy now, or is there suggestions we can make to actually see that enforcement um, in this new policy? 
Yeah, I mean, I'd start by saying there are a lot of really great staff at EPA who, you know, do try and, you know, enforce law, but I think funding of EPA and environment departments can be a factor in, um, in why they're perceived as toothless. I think sometimes compliance and enforcement policies can favour kind of this let's send a warning letter, let's have a softly, softly approach before the, the actual enforcements, the fines and the prosecutions. There's, um, there's a range of reasons why I think EPAs currently don't always go to the direct action. I think when we're talking about the urgency, we want to see that direct action. We want to see teeth in this policy, but that does take resourcing and staff um, to really galvanise change and a cultural change within the organisation. I would say we, we've been briefed by the new CEO of um, the EPA and his team, and they've said this is a foundation, this, this document, it's a starting point and a foundation, and there does seem to have been that cultural shift and a real intention to evolve the regulatory response of the EPA. So I think, you know, we need to really, really encourage that. Um, to encourage the EPA to show leadership and actually step up the regulatory response to get to the more direct regulatory tools that they have they have in their legislation and have had, have had for a long time. We want to really encourage that cultural change within the EPA. And I mean, I think I alluded to and I was talking before, a, a few years ago, the WA um, EPA put out greenhouse guidelines and got roundly criticised by industry. They had to, the minister stepped in, they withdrew the guidelines. They've only just been con consulted on again two weeks ago. So, you know, EPA history throughout Australia, there's differing EPAs throughout Australia and it can be challenging. EDO has actually written a report on, on best practice EPAs in Australia. So we have, we have looked into this. But what we want to do is encourage New South Wales to be a leader we want other jurisdictions to also be regulating greenhouse gases as pollutants. We want New South Wales to be working with the feds. We want to be talking about, you know, national vehicle emissions standards. There's a real opportunity for leadership here. And I think one of the good things with the court case, um, when we got the court order, the minister at the time, Matt Keane, said we won't be appealing this. this. We will be complying with this court order and we will be producing policies to address climate change so and as he's now the treasurer there is that high level support and hopefully that translates through to, to a more effective EPA. Thank you. Um, someone's asked whether New South Wales models its greenhouse gas emissions and if uh, those emissions are published if there's a carbon budget published that people can kind of monitor along themselves. Uh, in the action plan and policy, there uh, is some information provided modelling sources of emissions. It's pretty high level in these documents, but it does refer to state of New South Wales state of environment reporting and other sources. So I think if you dig into the, the footnotes um, and some of the, the other things that are cross-referenced here, there is modelling done, but... Um, yeah, certainly check out the, the references and if, if there's other modelling or more compelling modelling, feel free to put that in, in your submission because we, we want the targets that are developed to be based on the best available evidence and modelling. We want really robust science-based comprehensive targets. We don't want, you know, individually negotiated industry-based feasible targets. We really need to listen to the science and, and the modelling and make sure that that's got independent scientific, scientific expertise injected into it. Um, so someone's highlighted that the Victorian government provides households with funding if they swap from gas and wood-fired heating. Um, is this kind of um, idea something people could suggest in policy if they see kind of good things other states or other departments are doing? Could they kind of include those suggestions? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is an opportunity. If there's other actions that you've heard of that are working in other jurisdictions, absolutely um, put them forward in your submission for inclusion in this policy. It might be the case that the EPA is doing some of these initiatives to some extent. Um, and of course, they'd always be limited by what funding they have. But absolutely put them forward because if you know, if you, 
we can get actions into the policies and they tr translate to budget line items, then, you know, we want to direct funding at actions that are really going to reduce emissions and really help communities and households. So any good examples of things that are working in other jurisdictions are great to put in your submission. And when you're doing submission writing, it is great to be able to use examples from other jurisdictions that are working and be able to, you know, you know, provide really concrete examples of, of, of tangible and realistic recommendations. Okay, maybe a bit aside from the policy, but someone has asked if we can repeat the success of the court case at a federal level. Can we kind of see this action um, outside of New South Wales? Well, Matt and the Safe Climate team are always, <laughs> always happy to hear interesting climate ideas and um, Obviously, our, our safe climate litigation teams have a number of cases in currently and in the pipeline um, about how to compel governments to act. Uh, sometimes our cases directed at government, sometimes our cases are directed at private companies and industries and um, so forth. So there's always options. I think, uh, I don't know, Matt, have you got any views on that question? And it depends on the legislation as well. So there's currently no federal EPA, although the new government wants to establish one. So we will wait and see. Yeah. We, um, yeah, at the moment for the last 20 years, we have been doing the best we can with the Federal Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, but we've also been part of the um, review that has recommended overhauling that. And we're currently working closely with the Alliance of Groups um, of Environment Groups consulting with the government on their response to the SAMI review. And part of that is establishing a new EPA at the national level. And there is, um, there's draft legislation proposed by the Greens, but the government has also said they will exhibit draft legislation at that national level for an EPA. So at the moment, we're constrained by the, the 20 year old EPBC Act, but uh, in the future, we're hoping for not only a new EPA at the national level, but new national environmental standards that can really lift this. And then the next um, submission due next week is um, there's a climate trigger bill for the EPA. So there's a Senate inquiry in actually getting climate considerations built into the, the federal legislation. So that's submissions for that one close next week. In the, in the, there's a lot of submissions at the moment for those of you who've just written a carbon offsets one and a safeguard mechanism one we've got a climate trigger one coming up so there's always options for reform to get that systemic change but as, as has been in this case it's great to use a combination of litigation uh, and also have a reform strategy to get that systemic change Thank you. That's a good chance to plug our newsletter, which I will throw in the chat as well. So you can pop your email in there so you can see what new ideas Matt and his team comes up with. I'm sure you can follow along with cases and <laughs> with submissions that um, Rachel will direct you to. Um, I think that's most of the questions in the chat. Um, so I hope we've been able to answer your question. And thanks to Fiona for answering a few um, in the chat as we go. Um, so yeah, that's probably all for questions there if you wanted to wrap up, Rachel. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you so much um, for joining tonight. Uh, good luck with your submission writing. Hopefully EDO will be publishing our submission ahead of time if you're not sure, um, if you want some more ideas. But it will be largely based on the, the key issues we've identified tonight and that, that are in our, our briefing paper. But we'll continue to be working with bushfire survivors for climate action, meeting with governments, talking about why this is important, why this needs to have a whole of government approach to it and just really stressing how important this policy is and that it needs to first of all be supported but then strengthened given the urgency um, of the challenge that we're all facing. Fee, did you want to make some final comments? Um, I don't have anything prepared but the urgency is always um, it, it, my primary concern so uh, I would also encourage people to urgently make a submission so you don't forget about it um, and perhaps use the momentum we've created here tonight to um, maybe just jump on the EPA website now and have a look. It's really quite simple. Um, we'll block out some time tomorrow 
So, but yeah, thanks for joining everyone. I appreciate being able to um, share my story and present um, alongside the EDO, it's a privilege. Thanks very much, Fee, and thank you, Elise, for your wonderful chairing. Thanks for all the questions. Um, we'll have a look and we, we might be able to get back to those we, we didn't get a chance to answer tonight. Um, but thank you very much all for joining and good luck with your submission writing and have a lovely evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.